You are listening to Make Change Happen, the podcast from the International Institute for Environment and Development. The narratives and language we use to tell stories in the development sector can perpetuate racism and racial stereotyping. In this episode, our guests discuss work being done by IIED and others in the sector to promote anti-racist and decolonization agendas. Hello, and welcome to episode 18 of IIED's Make Change Happen podcast. I'm your host, Liz Carlyle, and I've been very honoured to have taken part in the last 18 conversations with partners, colleagues and friends as we've unpacked all kinds of issues across sustainable development. And if this is your first visit to the podcast, you're in for a great discussion with today's guests. But please also take some time to listen to others. I think it'll be worth it. Sadly, this is my last episode as host as I'm leaving IID, but it will be my huge pleasure to join the ranks of our regular listeners for future episodes. So I'm truly looking forward to that. Today, we're going to be talking about a challenging issue around how um, narratives we use to tell the stories in our sector can possibly perpetuate or probably definitely do perpetuate racism and racial stereotyping and how easy it is for language to exclude people from the conversation. And in IID, we've been doing some work to review our own narratives and to develop a framework that can help us, and we hope others, to explore that. But there'll be more of that later. I think for, to start this episode off, it's worth thinking that, you know, for people in countries across the global south, long history of struggles against racism and colonialization and lots of ongoing work to promote anti-racist and decolonization agendas. But that work's been going on, and until the killing of George Floyd, which acted as a kind of tipping point um, for the development sector sort of to step up, um, you know, that work's been going on in the background. And what we're hoping now that is it's become easier and safer to talk about racism and coloniality in the sector. You know, BLM was a trigger for that, and I think we need to make the most of that. In this episode, we're going to be looking at and reflecting on some examples of how development organisations have been looking at this and responding to the BLM movement, and to think about some of the intentions that they've set out towards becoming more anti-racist. That was a longer introduction than usual, but I think it was an important one. But even more important is for my guests today to introduce themselves. So let me go straight to Mpo Tapela and uh, ask you to say a little bit about yourself, Mpo. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, my name is Mpo Tapela. I'm the executive director of Youth Unlimited Network, um, which is based in Botswana, in the southern part of Africa. Um, it's basically an organization that coordinates the work of uh, non-profit making organizations that are youth based in Botswana. Thank you very much. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you. And Mariam. Hi, my name's Mariam. I'm the Head of Communications at BOND, the UK network for organisations working in international development. If you haven't heard from us before, we are a membership-based organisation. We have 400 NGOs and think tanks from across the UK, um, and they're all of lots of different sizes. So from small organisations like Advantage Africa, the Calico Trust, Build It International, um, to the larger medium-sized organisations um, like Oxfam, ActionAid and Save the Children. Great, thank you. And Natalie? Hi, my name is Natalie Larty and I work for IIED. I'm the Advocacy and Engagement Manager and have been doing some work around this issue of looking at inclusive and anti-racist narratives in the international development sector. Thank you. Well, welcome to you all. And we're really looking forward to uh, discussing this today. I was going to kick off with you, Mariam, because I know that Bond has been working to develop tools and resources that help NGOs to really become actively anti-racist. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing? Yes, of course. Um, so, as you said, um, Black Lives Matter um, and the tragic murder of George Floyd 
aired many issues about racism, power imbalances um, across, obviously, the wider world. But within the NGO sector um, in the UK, it was a real moment of reflection. And though we know that this conversation has been happening around, you know, how to tackle racism, how to make our sector um, embrace values around equity, diversity and inclusion more widely, um, it's undoubtedly been put much higher up on the agenda. Um, And it feels like there's a real moment where we can push forward some real change so that the way we work is much more locally led. And what I mean by that is rather than it being the case of organisations based in the UK flying into other countries and you know doing development or humanitarian work it's very much about working in solidarity with both the communities but also the organizations um, that are part of um, the countries that we actually work in Um, so it's much more about using what's there in a way that makes sense for the people that are there as opposed to us kind of pushing what we think needs to be done um, in other countries Um, And as part of that work, Bond's been doing lots of work to look at NGOs and the various ways that we work, be it via communications, fundraising, advocacy, programming, um, and unpacking how we work in practice right now and looking at what evidence exists across the sector um, and beyond about how to make how we work much more locally led. And so what I mean by that is things like, for example, fundraising. How can we make sure that when we're basically trying to pull more funding into projects, we're actually looking at what needs to be done from a community locally led perspective and getting more of that money directly to the organizations and people that are on the ground um, to the to as, as much as possible, because these sorts of changes make a real difference to make sure that actually what we're doing is what's needed and is being driven and led by the very people that you know we we, we say we're trying to support. Um, so there's a whole range of issues. So how did you get that consultation going? You know, how did people get in on the conversation? How, how did you how did you get that feedback in a way that you felt was was truly representative? Sure. So so the piece of work that I've been leading on at Bond has been looking specifically at language. So um, and the reason why I started by just talking about the wider remit of what we're working on at Bond is because it's really important to say that communications language is one component of the bigger picture of what we're trying to do here. Because the reality is communication sometimes can hide a multitude of organisational sins when it comes to anti-racism and decolonization. If you're not getting your practice right as an organisation, your comms isn't going to save you and nor should you be thinking about it in that way. So the language guide that we've been working on basically unpacks words that we've been using on a day-to-day basis. And it's an internal document for Bond. So it guides all of our communications when it comes to um, kind of advocacy work, but it also dictates how we speak to, you know, stakeholders like people in government or, um, you know, other NGOs or the letters that we write to the foreign secretary on various issues and also just the words that we use when we're talking about um, you know projects and the advocacy work and when I talk about words what I'm meaning is that it's things that we always felt uncomfortable with but we still carried on using them because we hadn't had this conversation about like why don't we actually just stop using phrases that we're uncomfortable with like beneficiaries or um, like capacity building or empowerment um, or um, you know, what does global Britain actually look like without putting it in quotation marks to make it clear that that's not our phrase, that phrase belongs to somebody else. um, And it's very politically loaded. So just really addressing some of the things that we didn't feel comfortable with. um, But also going through a process of consulting both colleagues across the sector, but also more importantly, um, groups of membership organisations that exist around the world, you know, phrases like global south, that was one of the really interesting conversations we had around that, but also world's poorest people um, and experts. These are words that we throw about, but actually it's important to check ourselves, but also check with colleagues around the world to see what their reflections are on these phrases that we use and whether they actually think they're appropriate in this day and age. Mm, it's, it's really interesting. I'm wondering, Mariam, what type of response have you had since you started choosing to use alternatives to some of those words. I'm hearing you saying expert and capacity building in Global South. And I'm just really noticing that there are words there that are part of our bread and butter. They're real stock phrases that we rely on. And I'm just wondering how that shift in language use has been received. 
It's a really good question. Um, at the beginning of the consultation process, if I look at um, you know the rounds of conversations that we had with NGOs in the UK, um, and I'll go to um, kind of the consultation process with colleagues around the world um, afterwards, but it was interesting because there were lots of questions around whether this would mean that we would no longer have access to um, government because we were no longer speaking the same language as them, or would it be problematic when we're filling in um, kind of bid proposals because is again like some of this language was dictated by donors um, and what we found in practice is actually it caused no issues whatsoever and what we've actually noticed is um, in the you know the latest international development strategy some of the language shifts that bond has been pushing for internally because we've not been telling our members or anyone you must be writing and using language in this way we've just said this is what we're doing if this is a helpful resource feel free to use it but what we are seeing is people are are actually using it. Um, and in terms of the feedback that we've got from colleagues in other countries, it was really interesting because you really understand the power dynamics that are inherent around language as well. So in some contexts, um, there had been lots of thinking that had already been done and you know, lots of resistance to words like beneficiaries, but there was never a space to actually say, do you know what, we don't want you to use that those words anymore because they don't reflect the reality on the ground. Or some of the phrases that you're using are actually inaccurate. You should use these terms instead. So that was another um, type of feedback that we got from colleagues that we were working with um, via um, kind of membership organizations like Compiler Initiative. They were fantastic at both bringing their expertise because they had been working on this for years, but also giving us access to um, civil society groups that exist around the world that had already been doing a lot of this thinking. Could I bring in an po here? Because I think um this point around how language can be chosen without consultation or on behalf of different groups, you know, might end up with labelling that's inappro- inappropriate or offensive. I mean, it's quite interesting. It's like who gets to choose the language. And Po, tell us, I know you, you've been working with deaf people and people with disabilities. You have lots of experience in this. Can you share some thinking on uh, what you have found? Absolutely, Liz. Um, when language is chosen without consultation and like you said, like on behalf of certain groups, it, it really results in labeling that is discriminating and has negative connotations towards the people that we're trying to help. So I have worked a lot with um, people with uh, disabilities, particularly the deaf community. And I can tell you for a fact that they find certain words very offensive that are used in programming. Um, words like... Uh, hearing impaired, they feel like those words mean that they're damaged and they need to be repaired. So they would prefer mostly just the term deaf to say, I am deaf. Do not say I'm hearing impaired. I am deaf. You know, words like people living with disability, uh, it, it's very offensive to them because they're not living with the disability. They would prefer to just be referred to as uh, disabled or people with disability. You know, words like marginalized populations. What, what does that even mean? A lot of times we say marginalized populations and it, it gets lost in translation when we're now in programming. If you don't unpack those words, at the end of the day, you, you don't even know who you're referring to. Um, instead of saying marginalized people, maybe one could say, when I say marginalized people, I mean people with disabilities. I mean people in less urban areas. I mean LGBTQ communities, you know, instead of just saying marginalized, because I find that, you know, blanket terms are highly inappropriate. And, you know, usually they would really, really exclude the very people that you want to help when projects are now being implemented. So I think it speaks, doesn't it, very much to Mariam's point about, you know, kind of who does get to choose or making sure that we, we speak to the communities or the groups of people concerned when, uh, you know, labels or language comes up. I mean, did did you find in your organization that you, you know you found good ways to do that or what what was this something that people were resistant to in your organizations? What what sort of response did you have to that idea? Well, essentially, we would always try to include them in our programming because a lot of times they would say nothing for us without us. So we always try to include them in those conversations so they can be the ones to say, no, you don't use words like that because we find it offensive. 
Yeah, no, that's good to hear. I think it's it's a it's a practice we should get better at, isn't it? Absolutely. Natalie, I mean, maybe this is the moment where you could say a little bit about, you know, the work you've been doing and and why we chose to do this review, because I think we I think you sort of drove the the motivation for that. But I think we were keen to kind of take this opportunity to have a bit of a deep reflection. Yeah, thanks, Liz. So at IIED, we have really built on some of this work around language and some of the challenges with language in international development, storytelling. And we've started to look at actually how we frame the stories that we tell and what worldviews and perspectives get prioritised when we tell those stories. And we decided to think about that work in relation to racism and anti-racism because of the bigger conversation that was happening nationally about issues of, of racial injustice globally. Now, um, I mean, all, all your listeners will, will know that IID is a think tank. And as you can imagine, writing is a real core part of, of what we do. It, it's, it's part of our kind of DNA. And so starting to think about how racism does or doesn't get perpetuated in the institute but we decided to start um, by thinking about our narratives and thinking about the stories that we tell and and how they do or don't perpetuate issues of racism Um, and and I suppose we we really thought that um, we wanted to draw on the knowledge of others that have been working in this space before us so we actually partnered with an academic um, who was a Global South academic working in the UK. Um, and what, what we were able to do with her support is find out what are the Global South scholars already seeing and identifying in terms of the racist narratives that are present in development storytelling you know, so we, we did a literature review to really try and understand what is being said in this space already. Um, and there were six kind of different um, dimensions, I suppose, uh, of racism that these scholars, <clears throat> when we really went through the, the literature, these scholars were pointing towards these kind of six different dimensions of racism that they felt are already being played out in, in development storytelling. So we really use those to think about how we were framing our work. That's good. Did you did you find that those kind of um, pointers in the discussion with colleagues did did they make sense or or was that was that a difficult conversation? Did did people get to that quite quickly? Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, the six dimensions were um, some of them quite um, common. There were things that we know and talk about already. So we talked about saviorism. In storytelling and we talked about exclusion and this idea that some people's voices are, are not being heard and, and some people are not choosing to tell their stories so they were quite familiar but there were some other dimensions of racism that we used to do this narrative analysis that were, were quite new to us um, and they were really interesting we had two dimensions one called being colorblind that was really to say that in storytelling Within the international development sector, we really avoid talking about issues linked to race. We might avoid racial descriptors. We might avoid talking about ethnicity. But we also avoid talking about racial injustice and oppression. Um, There was a second um, dimension that was all about neutrality and, and how politically neutral we are in the international development sector, particularly in in lots of our storytelling. And actually, with that neutrality, what we've done is avoid having conversations about colonisation and about these extremes in wealth and poverty that we tackle and their historical roots in kind of colonial exploitation. And so those two, those two dimensions together, we found that they really actually work together to 
kind of culminate unintentionally in in a narrative that really denied the role that racial injustice and racial oppression plays in the big critical issues that we work on uh, around global poverty, um, issues around food or hunger, climate. Um, so, so that that was really interesting, and and you know my sense is that staff were really keen to understand um, more about this. Um, we talks about Eurocentrism, that w- was another dimension, also quite well known. Um, and we talked about the white gaze, so this sense that we look at development work through a, a kind of a prism whereby we're kind of positioning white Western culture um, and the way that we organise our societies, for example, as something that's um, preeminent and maybe the ideal way of organising societies and we look at other cultures as being lacking maybe in the way that they organise their societies and, and we we ask other people to be like us and to aspire towards a white western culture and um, you know I think one, one of the really interesting things we found is how saviorism kind of sits alongside or on top of that that white gaze. So I think all in all, there were some quite familiar concepts that we used to do the work and some new concepts. And and people were really keen to kind of understand them as separate dimensions and understand how they work together. That's really interesting. And and you can see they're quite challenging. You know, the silence is is as big as making noise, isn't it? If not bigger. I mean, I'd like to, before we go on to that sort of question around, you know, the kind of white gaze and the positioning, do we see problems the same, which I'd, I'd love to ask you about, Mpo. I'm just going to ask uh, Mariam, did, did um, from your work around the sort of developing tools and the consultation with people, did, did what Natalie's just said, did that resonate with you, with your experience? Yes, it really did. Um, I think one of the things that really struck me when we were doing um, kind of our round of consultation process was also um, kind of the issue of um, like again it's the power dynamics around feedback but also this idea that there are lots of colonial undertones to the way in which the sector works that actually colleagues in countries might not even be aware about so there's also a responsibility for um, organizations to own this problem and this agenda um, and to ensure that our colleagues are part of the solution but don't assume that when we've been excluding them for such a long time um, during the process of you know developing things like funding proposals and how we do bids and how we do our comms they're not necessarily going to know what the solution or the answer is because they don't know what they're being excluded from so there's almost a bit of a, a owning what we've done wrong in the first place and then going forwards and rectifying it through consultation with our colleagues in other countries. I wanted to ask you about that, Mpo, because I know that, you know, your experience is, you know, quite specific here. You know, do people see the same problems? You know, what the challenge of kind of global north organisations pursuing the kinds of work they want to pursue? Are we consulting enough? Are these the same problems that Um, you and your organisations consider to be the problems. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, personally, I'd say, yes, we have recognised that problem, but it it is more like, you know, the elephant in the room that needs to be addressed because essentially uh, the Global South receives funding support from the Global North, right? So you have calls for proposals that are put forward, but they're already predetermined so it, it really becomes a bit of a problem because when the narrative is pre-shaped uh, for the global south in terms of focus areas, you have like predetermined focus areas to say uh, this call for proposal must specifically focus on one, two, three. Like say, for example, if it will focus on gender-based violence, it will be very specific to say this call for proposal is for gender-based violence focusing on women and girls. So I'm just thinking, what if we want to change the narrative and maybe focus on the perpetrator, look at the perspective of the perpetrator as part of the solution? Would that be a problem if we look at a boy child as a child, as opposed to looking at the boy child as a man who has just committed a crime? Like if we start doing that and changing that narrative of predetermined uh, focus areas, would it be a problem? I think it would, 
So with these focus areas or thematic areas, as they're usually referred to, uh, they're very restrictive. So we always ask ourselves, like, how do these organizations know this is a problem that needs addressing? Uh, like, really, how how is this a problem? Has there been consultation? It, it's really difficult, you know, Liz. It's really difficult for the Global South to really now criticize or openly challenge because they need the money, they need the funding. So they really just run the risk of of biting the hand that feeds them, so to speak. So it essentially kind of promotes systemic racism. So I'm just wondering, is the Global North aware of this problem, which is maybe a different topic altogether or a conversation for another day? So really to answer your question, I think there is a lingering problem that really needs to be addressed. I think it's a really good thing to say here. I think... You know, on some level, I'm sure Global North organizations who work in strong partnerships with people, and I I would put IID in that category. You know, I think we are aware of the uncomfortable bias of that kind of donor journey. But what I think is important and perhaps something we, we haven't got a handle on, and maybe is what Natalie said around this sort of look at the, the look at development work through that prism of kind of white gaze, you know, and there, there, there's a difference, isn't there? There's a subtle difference. And Natalie, I don't know, do, do you have a sort of, or you, Mariam, do you have a sense of that? I know that you, Mariam, too, have been doing thinking around sort of funding proposals and how people can be fully included in the process. But, you know, this balance between inclusion of voice and ideas, but in in the context of white gaze, you know, there is there is something quite complex there. Yeah, maybe just just to come in on that, Liz, I think that when we do work around language or narrative change, it can sometimes be conceived as work that sits quite clearly in a communications space but actually a lot of the language that we are exploring have quite detailed concepts attached to them that are really critical to how we program so for example just building what Mpo was saying the concepts of gender and the way that we understand that when we do development work is a very eurocentric um kind of way of understanding gender dynamics and gender issues Um, and while I think we're evolving that we're moving away from seeing gender as something that is predominantly about women and girls we're moving into this space that's much more concretely looking at gender roles looking at women girls men and boys Um, in some places where we program that very idea of gender as we understand it in in in, um, the western world it just doesn't always translate but we are trying to program still without having I suppose um, an eye to the fact that there will be a cultural difference one of the things I hope we can start to think about is that we can't program in a cultural vacuum or program in a way that is a bit tone deaf culturally you know just bringing a white western culture with our language and our concepts and kind of pushing that through um people communities countries of a very different culture that might conceive of that work in a very different way and still still hoping and imagining that we're going to get the type of impacts that we need in order to make the changes that we all collectively want to see. So I think that this issue of um, language and framing and narrative, it has another side to it, which is really closely wedded to practice. Um, And that definitely came up for us at IIED when we talked to staff about narrative change. We always slip into conversations about research and programs as we work on becoming more inclusive and driving an equity message through our narratives, we'll also see similar change happening in in practice and in research. So I think, you know, what a lot of this leads to is this, you know, where are the kind of safe spaces or platforms for discussion around language and Po, I think, am I right in thinking that, you know, you're you're not so sure that we do have the right platforms, you know, that the discussions can be uncomfortable? Absolutely, Liz. Um, there really aren't any specific or right platforms. 
because you know issues around language are usually discussed in workshops and on digital platforms but you know these are very uncomfortable conversations that i feel need to be tackled head on specifically you know not in between other unrelated conversations so i think that we need platforms that are backed up by intensive and targeted consultation and and by research you know um, leading to informed guidance on language that is appropriate and does not discriminate. So we need language that is more anchored on, on positivity and empowerment. So issues around language are, are not directly discussed. It, it, it's usually really passive and in between conversations. And, and that, that, is a real, that is a real problem. Mm, we can't kind of get to the heart of the issue. I can see it's, it can be difficult. Uh, we're getting to the stage in the in the conversation now where we're sort of drawing to a close. And on the Make Change Happen podcast, I always ask people, you know, um, what's the change they want to see right now? Or what's the big change they want to have happen next? Or what's the single biggest change they think that would make a difference? So I'm going to ask each of you that um, before we say goodbye. Uh, we know that this is a journey that we, uh, many people have started and done terrific work. And we know that it's a journey that many more people need to join in on. But what do you think the changes need to be? Uh, Mariam, what, what, what's the change you would like to see? I think for me, the point that you made around being brave and owning it. Um, and I, I think that's so important we come to this sector because we genuinely want to do something good and positive in the world. But I think sometimes as part of that, we can be slightly defensive when we're criticised for getting something wrong. And we really need to let go of that way of being that I do think exists in some parts of the sector, not everywhere. I think there are some organisations that are doing such incredible work on this. But I think in other parts, there is a slight defensiveness that, you know, they're not getting things you know, as they're not getting things wrong, or there are things that they need to change. And that needs to be um, addressed and owned up to. Um, But also, there's a question around us thinking about why are we in this in the first place? Like, are we actually here to perpetuate our own existence as organisations based in the UK? Or actually, are we genuinely trying to push forward or a, a world which is equitable and sustainable. And actually, we don't need to necessarily do the type of work that we're doing right now. So there's a real question around um, us actually doing what we're saying that we want to do and living our values. Um, and then I think the other thing is just very quickly that you're completely right. We need to be OK with getting things wrong. So there shouldn't be any naming and shaming around this as we learn and get things wrong and make mistakes. We all need to help each other out and be forgiving um, and kind in this process because it is difficult you know people will feel uncomfortable saying what they think because they're not sure if they're getting it wrong and you know as colleagues we need to be supportive of each other and just help each other along um, in that process so what's the next step for bond then what are you going to be focusing on after all this good work so we were actually launching a guide um in a few months time, which breaks down um, all of the kind of facets of being an NGO. Um, So advocacy, communications, fundraising. um, And we're looking at what does that look like um, when we're saying we want you to become locally led? What does that mean in practice for NGOs? Because what we're hearing a lot of is that, yes, we really want to embrace this agenda, but we just don't know what it means in practice. So we're hoping this guide that we will launch in September will help unpack that. And again, you know, that's been informed by a lot lots of colleagues through our various working groups um, that have been looking at locally led and are very well informed as well as doing lots of consultation but it's a live document so it's not going to just finish once we launch it in September but we're going to continue to update it and hopefully as people use it it'll evolve and become a much more useful and helpful resource over time Um, and then we've got a conference that's going to be happening in September called the Power and Development Conference which will again lots of the stuff that we've been discussing on this podcast right now um, it'll unpack all of those different segments to just air a lot of the thinking that exists, but also give our colleagues in other countries a platform to once again voice you know, what their concerns are, where they think change needs to happen and where we need to get to on this locally led um, development agenda. That sounds really interesting and lots to watch out for. 
And Poe, what about you? What's going to be, do you think, is a sort of a big change and, and kind of where are you headed next? I think for me, um, um, let's say in about 50 years, I would like to see um, Africa more self-reliant and self-sustainable. I, I want to see a world where we don't need outside funding because we have created social enterprises for, for sustainability and we're able to solve our own problems, you know, using our own resources. And, you know, in terms of next steps for uh, my organization, um, I think we're going to focus perhaps on creating such platforms where we're able to have uncomfortable conversations and uh, they will probably be um, uh, both at a national level and district level. So in terms of the national ones, uh, because, you know, you want to create a platform where people are able to to, to speak with ease, um, we're going to be looking at different players and make sure that we include everyone. Um, maybe we'll have a representative from the public sector or the government We'll have someone from the private sector, uh, a representative from civil society and, you know, the media, because you need those messages to be going out as well. And maybe uh, an educational institution for research purposes so that um, all our conversations are informed and backed up by research. Like, I really think that we're going to do uh, these platforms, uh, whether they're going to be in the form of panel discussions or workshops, we'll see how to tailor make them. And at district level, it would probably be um, consultations like focus groups in less urban areas, because, you know, you always want to have um, tailor made platforms so that people are comfortable in that setting. So it would take a different form for um, the district level, we'd probably have uh, consultations at, at Kotla meetings. Um, Kotla meetings, that is a term. Um, uh, it, it means um, a place uh, where people, it's a traditional setup, uh, which is highly respected. It's a meeting place where discussions are made, you know, decisions are made, and people are able to voice out their opinions freely um, with the silent protection of the Kotla values and norms. So I think this is very important because it really creates a level of comfort where people are able to have these uncomfortable conversations with ease. So I think going forward um, from my organization, we're going to definitely create create those platforms to specifically address these issues, Liz. Brilliant. That sounds so good. And building on something so tried and tested, and then we'll be, you know, sh sharing the learning for what you've, we've managed to build will be brilliant. Um, Natalie, last but not least, of course, what, what's the sort of a big change in the next step you're wanting to see? I think the, the big change in the next step I would love to see is having some influential organisation and, you know, heavy hitter voices in our sector, have them build on the work that's happened around language and narrative so far and start to really create alternative and new narratives for our sector that do two things. I think, one, it really needs to embrace and be open about the roles that race and power and injustice play in causing poverty and, and really getting clear that we will have to tackle issues of race power if we're ever to really reach our mandates and have that evolve and come through our narrative and be really live in our language. I think that that's one thing um, I think our, our new narratives need to have. And I think at the same time, um, we really need to make them much more inclusive, you know, really looking at different cultural perspectives, different racial perspectives, writing for very different audiences that come from different cultural backgrounds, you know, getting out of the, the echo chamber in a way. I think those two things together um, would, would be really exciting. And I, I think we can't underestimate how important it is that influential voices and organizations take up the mantle because we need these new narratives and these new words uh, to have traction you know they need to be widespread and so so we'll need some of our, our big figures in in the sector to step in and step up with that and and um, I think it's going to happen and on that note we must say goodbye. Um, I think it's going to happen too. And when I've been listening to all of you today and with your frankness and your honesty, 
uh, and your commitment to this, I, I think it can happen. And the more of us out there who can buy into that, the better. So it just remains for me to, to thank you all. Um, that's from Po to Pela, Marian Mosin and Natalie Larty. Thank you so much for a great conversation. And I should thank uh, IAD for letting me host uh, Make Change Happen. And um, it's time to say goodbye. And I hope you enjoy both this episode and previous episodes and future episodes. And just to say that the um, we're having a little bit of a summer holiday from the podcast and we will be publishing again in September. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. And you can find out more about today's podcast, our guests and their work at www.iied.org slash podcast, where you can also listen to more episodes. You can leave us feedback or follow the podcast at soundcloud.com slash the IIED. The podcast is produced by our in-house communication team and Tom Evans of ParticleSound.com. For more information about IIED and our work, please visit us online at www.iied.org.